All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Slept On Sports Podcast, the podcast where we share interesting, lesser-known sports stories, stories that you could say have been slept on. I am Connor Grohl, your host today, back again with a couple new faces, a couple new members of our Medill sports specialization. First off, uh, graduate of the University of Kansas and also a big Houston sports fan, we have Rachel Gaylor. Hey. And from the University of Wisconsin, we have Jonathan Mills. How are you doing, Jonathan? Connor, I do have to say that the intro is so much cooler when we're on recording in person than it yeah. is listening to it. So I'm, I'm ecstatic to be here. That is amazing. I'm super pumped. I'm glad you love the intro. It's always very slightly nerve-wracking because I feel like the first minute you're very much like rehearsed, like what am I going to say? How are we going to open it? And then after you get through the beginning of it, it gets mo- much more relaxed once you actually start getting into these stories. Uh, but I'm very happy to have both you guys on the show today to share our sports stories. I did say I wanted to take the lead on this episode. I have a very cool story. I don't think anyone on the podcast so far has dipped into baseball. Uh, I'm pretty sure no one has. So I wanted to go with a baseball story today. And I'm going to be talking about the youngest player to ever appear in an MLB game. So first off, question for you guys. If I say the youngest player in MLB history, how old do you think this player would have been when they made their MLB debut? 16? I'm thinking 17. I don't know how much younger they can go. Otherwise, they're going to have to be like potty trained. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. So we're actually, or we're a bit younger. We have, this is a 15 year old uh, that played in the MLB. Uh, This player's name was Joe Nuxall. And again, yeah, he was just 15 years old when he made his MLB debut. Uh, This happened on June 10th, 1944. So when you think about 1944, there was, you know, kind of a big event going on in the world at that time, Uh, you know, World (laughs) World War II. Uh, So, and this actually, this game takes place, you know, just four days after D-Day. So around this time, there were a lot of MLB players that were either getting drafted into the military or enlisting. And this left a lot of open spots on MLB rosters. Uh, And these teams, you know, have a lot of their star players, you know, going overseas, fighting in the war. Um, They need players to fill these spots. Right. And so teams kind of got creative in doing that. Uh, You know, they first, they, you know, brought up a lot of guys from the minor leagues as you would expect. Um, But also they were, bringing guys out of retirement to play. They were also, you know, signing these teenagers. Um, And especially, you know, some of these young kids, you have to think if you're signing a 15, 16, 17 year old, a lot of the time, one of the considerations um, that these teams were having um, is they didn't know whether or not the players on their teams were going to get drafted. So if you can have a a guy like Joe Nuxall, who's 15, you know, he's not going to get drafted because he's actually not old enough. So they ended up signing, yeah, this 15-year-old. Do we know his stat line for the day? I mean, at 15, yeah. I was definitely not in the ballpark, but I, I'm just wondering out of curiosity, <laughs> what, what's, what was his uh, Oh, yeah, we'll, we'll, so we'll get into this. So this is a really interesting story of how they actually sign him. So, they're, you know, this, so he plays, ends up playing for the Cincinnati Reds, uh, and the Reds actually in 1943, uh, the year before – um, you know, Joe actually makes his MLB debut. Uh, the, the Reds are going to, you know, local, I mean, it's kind of sounds kind of crazy, but kind of local, like adult leagues and stuff. And they're trying to, you know, find talent that they could, you know, potentially sign, you know, I guess more of in an emergency basis, you know, guys that you can bring on if you know you have troubles and you need a couple extra players. So they were actually looking at Joe's father, uh, a guy named Orville, who I guess went by Ox. Um, so they were kind of went to scout his father at one of these kind of recreational leagues. Uh, but then his son, a 14 year old Joe Nuxall, was on the team also. And they looked at this kid, and he was a six foot two, 14 year old. He was a junior high baseball pitching sensation uh, with an 85 mile an hour fastball. Um, and they looked at him and they said, actually, you know, this kid could be really good. 
you know, especially, you know, if they can sign him early and, you know, maybe he plays, maybe, maybe he doesn't, but at the very least you kind of get him, you know, maybe in the minor leagues uh, to kind of develop him. So they were kind of interested in Joe. Uh, his parents did not let him sign a professional baseball contract in 1943. They said he was too young and they wanted him to wait another year. Um, but in 1944, the year after, so now he's 15, they agree to let him sign a contract. Uh, so in, in February of 1944, he signs a contract with the Reds for $175 a month, and he gets a $500 signing bonus, uh, With which one of the things he does is since he's living, at, uh, living with his parents, he buys his parents a new carpet, which I thought was a fun detail. <laughs> um, so he buys a new carpet. Um, and then, so he, he gets signed in February, but again, his parents say, you know, you have to wait until school's out before you can actually play. So he's not actually eligible to play for the team until June. Um, real world then, problems, man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm a professional baseball player, but I have to wait till school's out in my ninth grade or whatever he's in. Um, so on June 10th, it comes, his, his chance comes pretty quickly. Uh, the Reds are playing the St. Louis Cardinals. And the, this Cardinals team, this is not the team you want to be going up against if this is your first ever MLB game. Uh, this is a team, they're led by Hall of Famer Stan Musial. And, Stan the man. Yeah, and these Cardinals will end up winning the World Series. So this is a 15-year-old. He's going up against the World Series champions. Um, he gets put in in the ninth inning. The Reds are already down 13 nothing. So their manager says, you know, what the heck, we're down 13 nothing. We're going to throw in the 15-year-old just to see what happens. Uh, Joe Nuxall does not think that he's going to play in this game, obviously. So when, when the manager tells him that it's time for him to warm up, he is, like, very nervous, very scared. Uh, he, he's walking uh, out of the uh, dugout to go warm up in the bullpen. And he trips on the top step of the dugout and falls on his face. Um, so he's very rattled. Uh, by the time he actually gets into the game, uh, he actually does get a couple outs quickly, uh, but then it very, very rapidly uh, descends from there. He ends up walking five batters. Uh, he allows two hits. Uh, and he gets ends up getting pulled with one out left in the ninth inning. So officially... In two thirds of an inning, he, um, yeah, he allows five earned runs, which ends up meaning he has an ERA for this game of sixty-seven point five. Uh, no, and technically, all three of our ERAs are lower. Than <laughs> oh yeah, and I don't want, to, and I'm not going to be the guy that says like, oh, I could do better. You know, not by any stretch of the imagination, but like, yeah, 67.5 is not exactly uh, solid. Um, I feel like since they were losing 13 to 0 at the time, they shouldn't even like count his ERA because like it did not make a difference in the game at all. No, no, it doesn't. It did not. And, and it's not like uh, I think it was a home game. So, yeah, it's not like they scored in the bottom of the ninth or anything. The game finished 18 nothing. Um, and that was the last game he ended up playing in the season. So he he does he finished the season with a with an ERA of sixty seven point five. Um, so again, not not the greatest um, first first taste of major league action, but the good news is he does get another chance later on in his career. The very interesting thing about this is, so this is nineteen forty five. In nineteen forty six, he decides to go back to high school. Um. Because he is still, so he's still eligible to play profession, to play high school in sports that are not baseball, I guess is the rule. Because I guess he's turned pro in baseball, but he can still play other sports. So he ends up playing basketball and football for his high school. He's this big All-American. Once he graduates high school, he goes back into the minor leagues, into the Reds organization. And then in 1952, at the age, I think he's, 21 when this happens i think he turns or maybe i think i think 22 um but he makes it back up to the majors and then from that point on he actually has a really solid career which is kind of interesting to see because you know seven years later who knows you know if he's going to turn out as a prospect or not 
Uh, but he ends up playing 15 seasons in the major leagues once he gets back in. Most of them come with the Reds. He's actually the all-time franchise leader in Reds history for most games pitched, for most appearances. Um, he is a two-time All-Star in 1955 and 1956. And he finishes his career with a win-loss record of 135 and 117 and, and an ERA of 3.9, which I should point out is much better than 67 and a half. Um, so well done for him. And then he retires. And then from 1960, in 1967, and then from then on out for the next 40 years of his life, he passes away uh, from cancer in 2007 but he spends the next 40 years as the Reds radio broadcaster. So it's a very cool story of someone who, you know, just got this random shot at when he was 15 years old. Um, but then, you know, he comes back in through the minor leagues and he pretty much spends the rest of his life in the Cincinnati Reds organization one way or another and actually ends up being a very solid pitcher for a long time. It's cool that you say that because, you know, a lot of these athletes, they say, oh, I've dedicated my whole life to the sport. And obviously some of them are talking about a couple of years, but this is a guy who literally, like you said, Connor, started at 15, yeah. worked his way through another 15 years, 16 years in the big leagues. And then he worked for the organization after up until he died. So, um, yeah, I mean, just a very really, neat story. Really, a, you know, a, a, a lifer there. And like, yeah, who knows what happens if you know, the Reds don't come to check out, you know, his father, which I mean, I think he's 14 at the time. And, you know, they're, they're coming to scout his father. His father's probably, you know, 35 maybe. And they come to check him out and then they discover his son instead. This only even happens because, you know, it's during wartime. And so they need to kind of get, you know, a little creative and try to, you know, find some extra potential prospects. But yeah, from that point on, you know, with the exception of he, he comes, he goes back to finish high school, which I think is fun. It's a fun part to the story. Um, but then, yeah, he then spends, I mean, if you think, you know, if this is 1945, he graduates high school probably in like 1948 and then enters the Reds organization. Yeah, then he's with the Reds for, you know, between minor leagues, majors, radio for like 60 years, which is, I mean, incredible. I mean, it rivals. You know, Vince Scully with the Dodgers is just about the only person that can say I think that they've been with a team for longer than that. So very cool. I, uh, yeah, I thought that was very interesting. I wanted to dip into baseball. Uh, but I know you guys both, I believe, are heading back into the pool of basketball, which I think is a uh, pretty, pretty big topic on this podcast. Um, but either one of you guys want to jump in? I well, I feel like since my story is kind of sad, I feel like we should go, and then if Jonathan's as happy, like we can end with a happy okay. story. Uh, Jonathan, is yours happy? Uh, depends on what lens you're looking at it, but just go kick it off, Rachel. Okay. Um. So my slept on story is about the 1977 Evansville University men's basketball team plane crash, which happened December 13th, 1977. So it's been almost. 43 years. Sorry, I had to do math real quick. (laughs) Um, So the 70s, Wichita State football team had a plane crash and then Marshall, of course, as we all know. But 77 was Evansville University, which is in Indiana. The 1977 season was their first year in Division I. They'd been very successful in Division II and they were going set to hire Jerry Sloan. The Hall of Fame coach, Jerry Sloan, is their coach for that year. But he ended up backing out, and so they hired Bobby Watson. And they had played four games before their plane crash um, with a 1-3 and record, and their last loss was to Larry Bird in Indiana State. So they were heading um, to Mifreesboro, Tennessee, to play Middle Tennessee State. And 90 seconds after takeoff, the plane crash, killing all 29 people on board, including... There are 14 players, um, the coach, assistant coaches, and other staff, like the radio guy and a couple of fans that were on the flight. And it was credited to pilot error. Um, but then the tragedy continues because there was one player who was not on the plane because he had been um, – he'd injured his ankle. He was a freshman, mm-hmm. David Furr. 
And he was a statistician at home games, but he didn't travel with them on away games. And two weeks after the plane crash, he and his younger brother were killed in a car accident by a drunk driver. So between December 13th and the end of the year, all the entire basketball team had died, whether it was a plane crash or a car crash, which is just absolutely kind of mind boggling and also so incredibly sad. Um, And then two months later, the Pittsburgh Steelers actually had a charity basketball game in Evansville to raise money for the families. Um, And this one guy, I was reading an article about it. He said that usually they might be like, here's our schedule. Here's here's when we're available. But the Steelers organization said, tell us when to be there and we will be there. And they showed up and raised money. Um, And then 33 years later, they finally played Middle Tennessee State and they had um, kind of a ceremony for them before the game. And this guy who was supposed to like lead them in, um, be their kind of liaison for the team, he was there and he was honored. And they have a memorial for the team. And it's just crazy how not just the plane crash happened, but like one guy whose life was spared because he was injured, his reprieve from death did not last very long. Um, and I mean, obviously probably just a coincidence, but it's a really crappy coincidence in my opinion. Um, So we're coming up on the 43rd anniversary there. And just like the fact that Jerry Sloan could have been on that flight, but because he decided at the last minute not to take the job, now he is a hall of fame coach and one of the more successful coaches from the NBA. Right. Yeah. There's a lot of crazy implications to this. And first off, like I want to mention, I think it's interesting and perhaps it's because you know, Evansville is a smaller, you know, kind of D1 program, although they still had some solid basketball teams. Yeah. They beat Duke last year. I remember that. Yeah, I mean, they beat Duke. Or Kentucky. Or no, they beat Kentucky. Yeah, and then, yeah, Kentucky. It's interesting side note. They beat Kentucky, and then they went winless in conference play, which was a very strange – I have no idea how that happened, but that's just like a minor side note. But um, but they had some. they had some better teams, definitely, I think – you know, maybe in the mid 2010s um, that I remember, but yeah, they said it's kind of a smaller program that maybe it doesn't get noticed as much, but you mentioned, you know, there have been some, you know, other plane crashes. Uh, and then, you know, only a few years ago, we had the plane crash with the Brazilian soccer team. Yeah. It was 2016, which it was like a little over four years ago. Cause I remember the anniversary was on like my time hop from Twitter the other day. Yeah. Um, that was, and I know, oh, I think I got, interested in the story because we were watching something about um eddie sutton my dad and i this summer when he passed away and he had been the coach when oklahoma state men's basketball team had their plane crash in uh 99 i think yeah um and so then i was like on a rabbit hole of course on wikipedia for all these like sports um crashes and then i saw this one and then just the tragedy of it i think is just really intrigue not intriguing it's sad but it's also like interesting yeah i i I definitely agree with that and i think you know this is something that i think somewhere in my head i kind of knew that something had happened but like you're right it's one of those things that i don't know if there's been you know a documentary or, or or something and i assume there probably has been at some point but it's definitely not something that has really crossed my radar. And it is interesting, like, you know, as you say, uh, the kind of the close calls with this situation and, and not to, you know, say that, you know, we're happy or sad that anyone was or was not a part of the crash, but like, you know, Jerry Sloan was so close to being the coach of that team. He ends up being a hall of famer. You know, I assume, you know, if they had just played, you know, Indiana state, there's probably one plane that's that team and one plane that's, Larry Bird's team uh, or, you know, maybe a bus, but, you know, even like you said, there was another crash with the other member of the team. So there are so many, you know, close parallels to this. And it's very strange how, you know, sometimes it's just, you know, so much that we don't want to admit uh, in life is just determined by like these random accidents that happen one way or another. Something that you did say that was interesting to me is you've said the Pittsburgh Steelers, had like uh, some commemorative fundraiser event or do you have any insight on why Pittsburgh of all places? Cause that seems 
kind of strange. I think I I, th- I read that it was they had their only one was against Pis- Pits- uh, Pittsburgh. Sorry. Okay. Um, from that season. And so there's something significant about it. I tried to look up further, but they didn't really explain anything more. It was just that the Steelers got involved with the situation. Um, and maybe they had a couple of players that were from there, but mm-hmm. uh, the, again, this story, like it, all the articles and the stories I've read are always surface level, but I've always wanted to go like a little deeper into mm-hmm. it um, because I think it is interesting. The fact that as the Steelers are playing now, um, they got involved and they did this charity event for the families of the survivor or the families of the victims of the crash. Right. And I mean, I think this just goes to show obviously what we've been talking about is an extremely tragic subject, but how powerful sports can be and not only, you know, raising awareness, but bringing people together, especially through tragedy, because time and time again, we have seen that, you know, when something tragic happens, we as humans crave that social connection and, sports brings people together and through this tragic event tragedy almost in an ironic kind of sad but fulfilling way brings people together as well and like you said Rachel for the Steelers just come in and say you give us the date and time we will be there like how cool is that to show from a professional organization from one group of people to another yeah absolutely I think that part of it is incredible and now that I'm kind of you know doing more (laughs) more research on this as we speak uh, it's so crazy that, yeah, you mentioned that this was the team's first season in Division I play. Um, the crazy part about this coach, Bobby Watson, uh, is that this was this, this head coach's, um, you know, first head coaching job at, you know, a Division I program. It looked like um, he may have had coaching experience in, as a head coach in D3, but this is really his first you know, big job. And, you know, it looks like he took over for a coach um, that had been their coach for the last 31 years. Yeah. Um, coach yeah, Mc- McCutcheon. Yeah. Who had led them retired to, the previous year. Yeah. Who had led them to five national championships in division two. And I think it's kind of crazy that, yeah, he decides to retire that season when they make the switch and it gives another person a chance to be a head coach and that gets so kind of tragically taken away from them. But something that I also don't want to neglect either is the way this team comes back, which I Mm -hmm. think is super interesting. And that like, you know, they go again, they go one and three and then, you know, they lose the entire team. And then as little as four years after that, uh, this team ends up, you know, winning their, they're playing in the Midwestern Collegiate Conference, which is now known as the Horizon League. But just four years later, they end up winning that conference and they end up making the NCAA tournament, which I think is actually really incredible. Yeah, to like turn around and have, because you're basically starting over when yeah. you lose your entire team. And so from the ground up, trying to get transfers and um, freshmen and try to build up that program again to four years later, be able to make the tournament is incredible. Yeah, I think that's you know pretty crazy. It just again, a twenty-three and six team, uh, even the year afterwards. And I think this should not go unnoticed either. The year immediately after this tragedy happens, because uh, obviously they would go on to cancel the rest of the season after the after the plane crash. But just the the year after, they go thirteen and sixteen, and that's immediately a you know a very competitive team that's coming out of you know basically nowhere. It'd be very interesting if. Um, not that I would ever wish for this to happen, but if the media back then is what it is now, what type of coverage would this have received on social media through obviously like documentaries, you know, interviews, like I'm sure back then the expansive cover, I mean, we know that obviously president Carter, I know, I think he offered his condolences to the team. I'm sure the coach or the coaches that were there, um, at the university got a lot of phone calls or the other, like uh, professors, but you know, what would the coverage be now today if this some an event like this would have happened back then? You know, it's just very odd and chilling to think about, but it's something I think that we should recognize as well as you know, aspiring Medill sports journalists <laughs> like we are. Yeah, honestly, like if I could make a sports documentary about anything, it would be this because there isn't really much media coverage about it, which I mean. 
maybe it's just because compared to Marshall, the numbers of the people that died is lower, but it's just, you look at the percentage of the team, 100%. Um, I think this one definitely is looked over. I mean, there are a bunch of tragedies, obviously, out there, but this one's definitely looked over, I think. Yeah, but absolutely. And you talk about this is not something that happened. You know, I think a lot of times it's easy to think about certain things that have happened in sports history as, you know, stuff that happened, you know, so long ago. Uh, but yeah, like you said, this story is only really 40 years old. I mean, this is something that, you know, are depending on the news coverage, but like our parents were old enough that, you know, if they were in the area, this is something they would remember for sure. Yeah. My, my dad remembers exactly what happened because yeah. he was graduating and my mom too, even she's not a big sports fan, but she, even she knew kind of about what happened. Um, and it's kind of think gotten lost over the years. So yeah, I think that was so. the story I wanted to bring today. That's why we have this on sports <laughs> podcast. So we can, Talk about things that we think are interesting or, you know, just underrated in some way that, you know, we wish more people would kind of talk about. Um, and I think, yeah, it's very interesting to hear about this story because, again, like, you know, most of our audience, I think, is probably younger and I think, you know, would pr probably not be aware of this. And to be able to kind of share some of these stories with you know, these younger generations, I say, fully aware that I'm a member of the younger generation. <laughs> but like, I think it's cool. So yeah, I'm, I'm happy we got to, uh, you know, talk about talk about this team a little bit. Jonathan, I hope you are a little more more uplifting. <laughs> although I, I know it's your story is very much. Um, yeah, it's like, like you said, it's kind of like hit or miss, depending on what what side of it you fall on. Right. And I think that, you know, for the most part, it's still a very good um, lesson learned story. So we're just going to jump right into it. Um, obviously, as you may know, big University of Wisconsin basketball fan. Um, I've been around the team, been with the team. And, you know, back in 2017, he was known in the state of Wisconsin as the chosen one. That was Tyler Hero, who is now obviously a budding star on the Miami Heat. That was his nickname. Whitnell High School, just in Milwaukee. I mean, I'll tell you, Connor and Rachel, this kid packed Milwaukee gyms when he was a high schooler. The amount of buzz that he received as a high, as a high school recruit was absolutely incredible. Um, he at one point he had ten phone calls after an AAU tournament, ten ver phone offers from different colleges. After one weekend of an AAU tournament, he had Kansas and Villanova come to Whitnell and visit him in the same week, back to back, because of how obviously how good he was predicted to be. And then I guess it was a little bit of a shock because of how early it was. He commits to the university of Wisconsin on September 12th of 2016. So for the university of Wisconsin basketball program, obviously coming off of the Frank Kaminsky, Sam Decker years, this was a huge get for their recruiting class because they had swung out and missed quite a few times after the Kaminsky and Decker. Um, but one year later, Hero announces on Twitter that he is decommitting from the university. And when I saw this, I remember when this dropped on Twitter, I saw this and I read his message. You know, he talks about how he thinks about, a, about the first class coach of Greg Gard. He discussed, you know, how he talked to his family, highlighted how he grew as an individual, thanked the state of Wisconsin for always supporting him. Uh, he, this is what he said. He said, I wish with university of Wisconsin, nothing but the best. The state has always treated me with tremendous support. And I always call Wisconsin my home. I mean, I don't know how much more honest as a student athlete, as a high schooler, you can be when you say that, like I respected his decision a ton, but you know, his honesty, his openness, his, you know, announcement in advance was greeted with, um, a couple of tweets and then a couple of real life scares. Uh, he woke up one morning after he decommitted and found that his whole house and yard was spray painted and it said FBBN on Wisconsin. Um, another tweet, typical millennial, no morals, no loyalty, dot, dot, dot. You're going to start your first game like Hayward today, referencing Gordon Hayward when he obviously really gruesomely injured his leg. Yeah. I hope you stay healthy when your career falls in shambles. Worst luck in your playing career. 
Um, another story of Tyler Harrow at a gas station and a man told him, walk across the street. I hope you get hit by a car. The high school received death threats. I mean, this is just a kid who was about as honest as he could be about not wanting to go play. And here is the entire state, Wisconsin Badger fans, you know, months ago that loved him for committing and now are sending him death threats. And it's just funny to me because, you know, we are built on as athletes and for some of these people to have our own strong opinions. And seemingly everyone gets to have an opinion if you agree with their opinion. And I just find it how ironic because, you know, here's Tyler Hero with a strong opinion of his own, a decision of his own, and he's getting death threats for just being himself. And he bet on himself. He obviously, as the story goes, ends up going to Kentucky, ends up really being a March Madness star. And now he's an NBA star. And, you know, personally, if he's still, if he committed to the University of Wisconsin right now, he would still be on that team just because that system is not built for Tyler Hero. Mm -hmm. And it's just, I don't know. I, when I hear these stories about what he, the reactions he got from his former friends, from his neighbors, from his, everyone else in the state, it just shocks me because he's still a kid. Right. I mean, I think, you know, especially in the social media age, but I think really this has been a problem for a, a long time is that people don't really understand that aspect of it, uh, of, of people, you know, just being kids. And like you said, it's very much the way, way too many people kind of see situations is like, well, I'm going to like or hate this person depending on like, if he plays for my favorite team or like he plays against my favorite team or whatever. Um, yeah, I think that makes it a crazy story. I think the fact that he's a local kid is probably a, a big con contributor contributor to that. Um, and also that Wisconsin, you know, is such a strong program, you know, itself that had recently had a um, trip to the national championship game. When you originally brought up this idea, I thought that maybe the decommitment might have had something to do with the the coaching transfer from Bo Ryan to Greg Gard, but this actually happened after that. So, so right, it happened after that, and you know, a couple of former players, Nigel Hayes being one of them, had stepped out and said, you know, I actually, I'm not sure if Nigel Hayes was trying to take credit for this or if he was trying to, you know, prove something against the UW system in itself. But he was one of the people that said, you know, I had told Tyler that this isn't a good school. Um, this, if you want to play basketball, this isn't the place to go. And, you know, great for Nigel for saying that, because I think that the way that the Wisconsin basketball system works, having seen it and, you know, been around those people, it brings up and elevates the average player. It is not meant for the top tier player. And that's just the harsh reality of it. And that's why it's a good school for a lot of these walk-ons, a lot of these, you know, three, four-star recruits. It's not going to get the five-star. I mean, you saw last night Michigan State Duke. Jalen Johnson starting on Duke. He's from uh, the Madison area. So mm -hmm. it just kind of goes to show, you know, this school is not going to attract that talent, nor is that talent going to want to go there. Now, that may – I mean, again, some guys are diamond in the rough. Some guys like playing for that school. But regardless of where you go, you it's just unacceptable to treat a player like that, especially for someone like – Mr. Hero, who is really being as honest and open as he could be throughout this whole process. And I think a lot of it might also have to do with the fact that he went to Kentucky, which, you know, Kentucky, Duke, Kansas, a lot of people hate these schools because they're blue bloods, you know, they're consistently always at the top. And um, especially John Calipari, he's very, he knows that, you know, I don't want play, I, I'm not a player guy who's going to be here for four years. Like, Occasionally they'll have, you know, four-year players, but usually if you want to go to the NBA, you go to Duke or Kentucky because that's where it's going to get you fastest. And for a lot of these players, especially like who are want to go to the NBA, college is really just a stopping ground. It is because they have to go or they have to, they can't come right out of high school, which I think is kind of part of the problem. But um, so it doesn't, I mean, they're going to only going to be there for a year. And so I just don't understand. I guess also because he is, he was what, like 17 at the time too? Right. Probably. And I mean, he was also one of the biggest names to come out of the state of Wisconsin in terms of athletics in the last decade or so, I would argue. And, you know, for him to come home and have his dad's car egged 
his front door filled with tomatoes. He'd be at basketball games. People would um, have like snakes, stuffed animal snakes in the crowd. I remember reading a piece about how his mom was fearful that he would go to Applebee's at 10 o'clock at night because he, they, she'd think he'd get beat up in Whitnall. I mean, like, really? How low are you going to go for an a- like? And this is someone that you t- two weeks ago were saying how he's going to be the next best thing since sliced bread because he's playing for the team that you like. And yeah, and the fact that like you should be so proud that a player from your town can go and have the opportunity to go play for a team like Kentucky or Duke. Like these teams are always at the highest level; they always get the best recruits. And the fact that your kid and your like this guy is one of them you should be proud of that not like want to murder him because he didn't choose your school and like he's doing he did what was best for him and i think it worked out pretty well um yeah the I fact would, that yeah. i mean his bubble performance and his uh drip that he had at the nba draft you know a year ago was great yeah and i you know i don't think as much as some people might you know, hate schools like Kentucky. I mean, I don't think you can ever blame someone for going to Kentucky. I heard Dick Vitale say yesterday, uh, and, and I'm, you know, I haven't independently fact checked this, but I, I think it's probably true that he said 11 years in a row, Kentucky has had at least two players get drafted in the first round of the NBA draft, which is like, you know, unbelievable. And you, know, you just think to yourself, it feels like, you know, half the NBA is from Kentucky. You know, it's just yeah. proven like those than- graphics they had in the NBA, like during the playoffs of all the Kentucky players, like they could make, make two all-star teams at least. Yeah. With all the and Kentucky like, players they've had. Yeah. It, it's ridiculous how many players they've had. And I think, it, I mean, it definitely is the, the number one uh, school in terms of creating NBA, NBA draft picks and successful NBA careers. Uh, I think Duke is up there with, you know, a lot of other draft picks as our other schools, but Kentucky has really had, you know, a lot of stars come out of their program. Um, Right. And I don't want to get too far into the weeds with like the recruiting prospects of it, but you see these really strong draft classes, excuse me, by Duke, uh, Kentucky, Kansas, I would argue, Rachel, um, these basketball schools and, you know, heroes decommitment in 2017 really it's almost tanked the 2018 recruiting class that Greg Gard had. And it ended up only being three members after Hero. And it was Taylor Curry, who then actually went to a, I think a, a low Juco, maybe a, a tech school in Michigan. I can't, but he stepped away from Wisconsin. Ty Strickland, the son of the former NBA star Strickland, and he actually transferred to Temple. And then Joe Hedstrom, who really hasn't played at all. So Greg Gard has put had put all of his eggs in Heroes Basket. And I think from a, a Wisconsin basketball stance moving forward, Gard has really improved on that front. But again, it goes to show you how important that recruiting pipeline is for these big basketball schools because if they don't land some of these big name guys, you're only swaying that the fandom and the anger that you have towards a lot of these players. And that gave a lot of the people a reason to do what they did to Tyler. And again, there's no excuse to it, but you can kind of start pointing fingers on what may have gone off the rails for some of these fans and probably why Tyler was hesitant to sign the dotted line. Yeah. And I think it's worth bringing up that this is so important because the basketball, I mean, the team size and the recruiting classes are so small that like, if you have one player like Tyler hero, it really, I mean, I think Wisconsin is going to be a strong program, you know, pretty much regardless most years. Uh, But you know, that can definitely elevate them to, you know, a final four contender or can elevate, you know, some of these smaller schools to big name schools. Like, you know, people don't know too much about a school like Murray state until they have John Morant, for example. Yeah. Um, although Murray state actually has had a couple other kind of good players run through there. But uh, I think the fact that, yeah, like you said, they, without him, they only have three other, you know, recruits in that class. Um, and, and then of, two dropped out or two left. Yeah. So, I mean, that's a yeah. old, one for three, one for four. If you're counting the guys that stayed then left, I don't even count them. And the last three star, he doesn't even play. Yeah. Uh, now that I think an important part of this story is that Tyler hero has become so successful at Kentucky. And now, um, you know, with the Miami heat where I think that was a team, a lot of people thought was going to be 
good this season. Um, but I think pretty much the cap on expectations for the most part was like a second round playoff team. Uh, but they did end up going, you know, to the finals and they had, you know, an incredible performance this year. A lot of standouts, you know, a huge year from Bam and from Tyler and from Duncan Robinson and Jimmy Butler and everybody really. Um, I wonder if you have any sense of now that he has become so, so successful professionally, if people in Wisconsin have kind of forgiven him for, you know, lack of a better word, or if people still kind of hold that animosity towards him. From what I've seen, and I have a couple of friends that go to high school in Milwaukee, and I have a couple, and obviously just from the social media posts I've seen in Wisconsin, it is now, oh, Tyler Hero, that's my guy. Exactly. That's that He's Wisconsin our hero. guy. Yep. That's that hometown hero. But I mean, a couple of years ago, you weren't saying that. You were throwing tomatoes at his house. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so to answer your question, yeah, people embrace him and rightfully show, so, regardless of what school you go to, if there's someone from your state that is making headlines on national television on a nightly basis, why not support them? Why not, you know, root and have their name on the back of your jersey? Why not do that? It's a sports fandom, it's pride. And Wisconsin's not really the school for these mega superstar athletes. So this is just another name on the list. Yeah. And I was kind of hoping that you would say that and kind of like anticipating that you would say that, yeah, people jump, you know, all on board with him. Cause again, it's like, well, now that you're doing something good and now it's like, it's not like, you know, now that you're in the NBA, it's not like you're playing for someone that's competing against Wisconsin. So now we're going to, you know, love you all over again. And like you said, people, you know, have such an affinity for people that are from where they're from. Like uh, for Rachel and I, Jimmy Butler is from Houston. Um, so part of the NBA finals was like, you know, me rooting against LeBron, like I always do. <laughs> but part of it was also like, hey, you know, this is a really fun Miami team. Jimmy Butler's from Houston. Like, you know, it's so interesting how, yeah, the second that someone is doing something really good. People will just hop on the bandwagon that quickly. And all of a sudden, you know, he's the greatest basketball player that's ever come from Wisconsin. Um, I will say Lakers also had a, um, they had Markeith Morris who played at Kansas. So my loyalties were very much split during that one yeah. because LeBron has never won a NBA championship without a Jayhawk on his team. That's a crazy stat. Mario Chalmers in Miami, and then Shaka Khan in Cleveland, and now Markeith Morris in the Lakers. Wow. That could be another podcast. <laughs> that, episode, that could be another slip That could be another episode or some kind of story or whatever, like tracking the, the Kansas <laughs> Yeah, he talked about it in the, um, the 2016 when they won and had their parade for Cleveland. He mentioned it. Yeah. Um, but back to Tyler Hero. I think he's a cool guy, and it really sucks that – like as a 16, 17 year old kid having that happen and being like blamed for all this stuff that you're just following what you think is right. It's just because they had like what, I mean, I bet none of those people really like followed. Do they really follow Wisconsin basketball or they were just mad? It was a surprising amount of the was, let me backtrack here. The Wisconsin basketball fan base is loyal to a T and I think it's a good and a bad thing because a lot of people don't like the system as fans, but they embrace it because that's just the Wisconsin way of doing it. So a lot of these fans that, you know, were doing these things to Tyler and saying these rude things were Wisconsin basketball fans because this was, again, one of the highest recruits that the school had ever gotten. Um, they were coming off a very successful couple-year run with Bull Ryan, and um, you know, why not continue that streak of success? So to land a guy like Tyler very early in the recruitment period was a huge get for the Badgers. So to answer your question, Rachel, I guess at the end of the day, uh, yeah, it was actually, unfortunately, a lot of Wisconsin fans that had followed the team closely, in my opinion, that were saying these things. Um, and they, were, they obviously weren't using their head. They were a little biased. Yeah, and, and like Jonathan was saying, you know, in, just in terms of play styles, I think he made the right decision because Kentucky – Calipari is maybe the best talent developer in the game. And, and Kentucky, I think, plays, you know, a much more NBA focused offense because so much of his deal is that he's turning these guys into NBA players. Whereas Wisconsin for, you know, so long has really just been known as one of the greatest defensive teams and a team that plays at a much slower pace, which can get you 
just as much success in the college game, but in terms of, yeah, you want to turn Tyler Hero into a lottery pick, it's not going to have the same effects. Right. And kind of going off what you said earlier, Connor, I mean, this was the changing of the guard when Bo Ryan and Greg Gard were kind of having that, you know, shift in power. In 2015 with Bo Ryan, maybe Tyler Hero would have fit. Bo Ryan's offense was a little bit quicker on the wing. They had guys that actually shoot. They moved the ball well. But with Greg Gard, the system changes to fit the personnel. And Greg Gard is not an offensive, heavy first coach. And, you know, no knock on guard. He's a great coach, a great person. And it just would not have worked with Tyler Hero there. Yeah. I mean, I'm just looking at, you know, some of, you know, these, these teams from 2015, the national championship team from Wisconsin, they allowed 58 points a game, you know. A couple years after that, 63 points a game, 62 points a game. This is rarely a team that is, you know, an outstanding offensive team, although they have had, you know, some of the players like the Deckers and Kaminskys that have made, you know, runs to the NBA. But, I mean... But, I mean, I feel like they haven't been as successful as Tyler Hero has been in just his, you know, first season. Yeah. Exactly. And, you know, I there's a lot of AAU coaches around the state here and even in the Midwest that are advising players not to go to Wisconsin, which is very odd to me because I don't know what's pushing that stereotype right now. I'm not sure if it's word of mouth. I don't know if it's just the development and the personnel that's working there, but people have to understand that uh, there's never been a star player at Wisconsin. It's just been a bunch of guys that buy into the system and they played effectively. That's why, why you said, Connor, they're so effective at what they do but I mean, in the last couple of years, I couldn't, when they do these player showcases or they send out like a team calendar, there's not just one guy that's showcased. It's the entire roster because that's what the system is. And Tyler Hero would have not have gelled well there because Tyler Hero's personality, the personality of Kentucky basketball is that one and, go, one and done player, like Rachel said, where that stepping stone is to get to that next level. And ultimately he's doing just a fine job at that right now. Yeah, absolutely. And now I, I take a look at the 2019 draft, and you see P.J. Washington from that Kentucky team went number 12. Mm-hmm. Tyler Hero went number 13. Keldon Johnson went number 29. There's three guys drafted in the first round out of that Kentucky team. And the crazy part about that is that seeing that the top guy drafted from Kentucky went number 12, my first thought was like, that's actually a down year for them. Because of just oh, yeah. how high the expectations I think, are. I don't remember. It was this year. I don't remember like the top, but no Duke, Kansas, or Kentucky players were drafted, I think, in the lottery or the top 10 this past draft. Yeah, I think I think you're right. But even still, now we're looking at the 2020 draft. Well, Tyrese Maxey went number 21. Well, Emmanuel quickly went number 25. You know, they still have, you know, they have... Two players Nick, in the top, Nick first Richard, round. Nick Richards went in the second round. Like, they still... That's another year. Like, still three more guys drafted. Was anyone drafted from Wisconsin in this year's draft? I mean, it's one year, but no. <laughs> you know? Right. I think you had more guys going overseas to play from Wisconsin than you did probably guys that have been drafted by Wisconsin in the last two, three years. Yeah. But, again, Wisconsin's not built to, you know, get you to the next level of the NBA. It's built to, you know, be a team player, learn how to be a hard I again this is no knock against the school and the program it's just it's different than Kentucky and it's different than even a Michigan you know and that's not a bad thing yeah and in fairness like there are not many schools that their whole objective is to send guys to the NBA i mean i would argue you really don't even see that many one and done players from Kansas and North Carolina yeah, you not know, Kansas. Could, our last one and well, I mean, our last successful one and done, you could argue, would be like Kelly Oubre. I mean, yeah, I was gonna say like you had was Josh Jackson a one and done, but he didn't. Have yeah, a but he, great career, no, you he, know, and he like so yeah, he went barely to the, hanging on to rosters. Yeah. So, yeah, it's mainly just Kentucky and Duke, or uh, yeah, Kentucky and Duke, and then you know you do see some guys in the Pac-12, some guys from you know UCLA or whatever every now and again, but. For the most part, there are two schools that are really like full into the one and done game. And if you have enough faith in yourself that you think, you know, I can really be a, you know, a lottery pick and you're willing to, you know, take that chance on yourself, you know, and for Tyler Hero, it worked out. I mean, there's, you know, two schools you can go to that their whole point is they basically bring in five or six 
four star, five star recruits every year. And they hope that the majority of those guys get drafted in the first round the next year. And they're pretty good at doing it. Yeah. So it's pretty, it's pretty crazy to see, you know, that story and how people can go so quickly uh, from, you know, again, loving a guy like Tyler hero to, you know, again, death threats and the whole, all the works. And then, the next season where he becomes this star for the Miami heat. Um, and really one of the brightest young guards in the league. And all of a sudden we love him again, but that's just how uh fan base is. That's, that's sports. Yeah, that's sports. <laughs> you know, we, we love it. We hate it, but yeah, I mean, there are definitely those aspects of people take it far too seriously. Right. Um, and this story, and I, I, again, you know, Tyler Hero is a big one because of how big he is right now, and especially you having the kind of Wisconsin relationship. But this is not a story that's that unique to Tyler Hero either. It's something we see happening all the time. Right. Right. I just, you know, obviously with relevancy and then, you know, Wisconsin basketball as of December 2nd, 2020, number four in the country, it's a story that should be shared. And even, even so, just, you know, showing the, flaws of kind of where we are as a society and sports fans kind of where we need to pick ourselves up a little bit and just be a little more respectful. I just think that, you know, like you said, Connor, people can flip so quickly, but there's no need to, there's no reason to, it's just a game. Tyler's trying his best. Rachel, you and I are trying our best, you know, let us, let us grind. Right. We're all, we're all trying our best. <laughs> I think that's the, su- that's the summary for 2020. Yeah. I'm just trying my best. That's right. <laughs> My best today is not my best last year. It is just my best today. Yeah. And you know what? I think that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. All right. Well, I think um, that about wraps up the Tyler Hero story. And we'll see how his career continues to progress. Again, one of the brightest young players in the NBA. Uh, and now one of the favorite players out of Wisconsin. I would love, I bet, I bet he's like the most popular jersey selling out of Wisconsin right now. Um, yeah, probably well, him or Aaron Rodgers. Usually Aaron Rodgers is somehow still up there. I mean, Giannis plays for Milwaukee, which is in Wisconsin. So that- Yes, Giannis has have been very popular too. Um, I, I'm, those, yeah, I'm wondering. Like, Yelich. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I got a lot of guys really out of, out of Wisconsin. I was going to say, I wonder like who hasn't bought the Aaron Rodgers jersey that's like, well, now I'll buy an Aaron Rodgers jersey. I um, feel like you had kind of time to do that. I should get a now a new Drew Holiday jersey for the Bucks. Yeah. That would be clean. Yeah, my favorite player. Oh, really? Yeah. Nice. Jonathan's had a dog barking. Yeah, my dog's barking outside my room, so I apologize for the uh, <laughs> feedback on there. Not that bad. I think I think we all love dogs on the podcast. <laughs> but yeah, so thanks uh, so much to both of you for jumping on the pod today. Sharing our slept on stories, maybe we'll we'll have you back in a future episode. Um, but you know, back back after a, a short hiatus. But I think some more episodes coming uh, here in December and into 2021. Can you believe 2020 is almost over? I mean, I think this year has gone on for about four or five <laughs> years, but it's been a decade already. It's been a decade. So more episodes of the slept on sports cast. Slept on Sports Podcast coming in the 2030s, I suppose. <laughs> um, but again, thanks so much, both of you, for coming on. And we'll have some more episodes coming out. Thanks so much to everyone for listening. Remember to subscribe to Top Level Sports, like Top Level, or Top Level Sports. That is an old Connor project. <laughs> uh, <laughs> subscribe to Slept on Sports and follow on Twitter at slept underscore on underscore sports. And we will see you again real soon. All right, see you guys.